It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 326 of Science on Top, recorded on Monday the 11th of March 2019. I'm Ed Brown and with me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. And planetary scientist and high intensity powder diffractometer specialist, Dr. Helen Maynard Casely. Hello, thanks for having me back. Welcome back. How have you been? I'm pretty well. How is everybody? Splendid. Yeah, good, thank you. <laughs> excellent. But we are coming to the end now of our campaign in support of two excellent charities, Doctors Without Borders and the Fred Hollows Foundation. These were the preferred charities of a close friend of ours, Penelope Green, who sadly passed away at the end of last year from lung cancer. This is our way of remembering her and honouring her. We're donating all the Patreon contributions we receive for those 10 weeks to her preferred charities. And this is week nine of that campaign. So if you already donate each episode, thank you. You're making the world a better place. And if you want to be a part of that, head to scienceontop.com slash donate and contribute there. But let's begin now and talk, Helen, about the Mars InSight lander. We've mentioned it a few weeks ago, I think, that this is the NASA probe that's landed on Mars and it began drilling down. I think it was supposed to go about five meters below the surface, but it's hit a snag or at least it's hit something hard. What's going on? Um, Well, it's actually trying to do something quite extraordinary. Um, I I don't know if you think about this, but like digging a hole on another planet is actually really tough. Um, I'm trying to think, I was, I was trying to think of what's the deepest hole we've ever dug on another planet and there was a mission called deep impact which (laughs) might give you a clue but uh, it wasn't the moon it was a a body i think it was an asteroid that they um smacked a small um impactor into and made a hole probably about 100 maybe about 50 meters deep and they threw a load of stuff and they managed to catch some of the stuff and of course um Hayabusa 2 has just done um, mm-hmm. something very similar on the asteroid Rigu, where it's it's also smacked a small impactor. So digging holes on other planets is not uh, it's quite dramatic and it's not an easy thing to do. Um, we've tried it on Mars before. Um, the Viking lander um, back in the 70s tried it, um, didn't get very far. I think they might have made a few centimetres in. <laughs> And this is a problem because, um, like, even on Earth, do you know what the deepest hole we've ever dug on Earth is? Oh, it'd be 14 kilometres or so, isn't it? Or... Oh, very good, Ed. Oh, wow. You've read about this. Yeah, it's the Kola Super Deep Borehole, which is in Russia, and it's about 12 kilometres deep. But that's that's it. Um, and really, to know anything about the interior of a planet, we've got to go a bit deeper. And the great thing about, for instance, the Kola Super Deep Borehole is you're able to see how the heat changes, and especially that bit of Russia, which is the really, really thick continental crust, they're able to see sort of how the heat changes and how it moves around, and also to see how um, earthquakes dissipate through that area. Um, So that's what they're trying to do on Mars, because um, Mars, we know, doesn't have plate tectonics like we have um so automatically that begins to make us think you know is the crust a bit thicker um but we don't really know for sure and i think insight i mean i'm a little bit down on mars exploration sometimes i mean it's a lot of money for somewhere that's a bit dusty and a bit boring but (laughs) insight is probably the most interesting mission to be sent there ever because it's looking entirely about the interior of a planet i mean that's 
kind of my bag. I'm really interested in what's going on on the inside. And of course, they've got seismometers to listen for Mars quakes and, and things like this. But the real big thing was to dig a little hole and to get in there and to see how the temperature was changing. The other nice thing is that the the drill, it's actually, it was designed by the German um, space agency and it's sort of flown on insight. That's the that's the nice thing about insight it's not just a nasa mission it's um it's there's bits from lots of ESA european space agency agencies and this particular drill was made by the germans and they tested it very thoroughly and it was working very very well before it went to mars um so the problem is that they've tried to deploy it and so they had to it has to move a bit away from the lander and it's got this little probe that sort of hammers down and then sort of waits a bit and in that waits a bit what it does is it heats up a bit and it sees how quickly the heat moves away so it measures the thermal conductivity of the of the crust around and the idea was it was going to do this down to about five meters however as of last saturday night they hit a bit of a snag um they think they've hit um, a bit of harder rock than they were anticipating and to um quote nasa in their official nasa page they say that they were um hammering all of saturday night to no significant effect we've all been there (laughs) so it's a bit of a shame and the other kind of the interesting thing is this isn't the only shot that we're going to have at this um, um, because the uh, the ESA mission, the European Space Agency, are also planning a small rover called ExoMars, which should be landing in a couple of years. It actually, I think it's meant to land in the same window that the next big Curiosity-esque rover, the Mars 2020 rover, is going. So basically 2020 is going to be an exciting year for Mars. But the ExoMars also has the potential to hopefully drill. They've actually said they're going to drill to 10 metres. So um, I think that team are probably going to try and learn a lot from what's going on at InSight right now. I guess at least the the uh, the bar's been set a bit lower. They don't need to go to 10 metres. They can go to, I don't know, a foot, and they've still done better. So that you know that, yeah, that's a good thing for them. It's true. But the thing is, it's it's – really good that the geophysicists like any meter is just brilliant because um there's a lot of change like on earth there's a lot of changes at the top part of our of our crust and to really understand a bit more about the general crust of of mars you've got to get beyond the first few meters because um that's all the sort of bit that's been churned over well i would say relatively recently but in mars relative recently could be a billion years but Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's it's that sort of side of things that you want to get down a bit deeper and a bit older to really get an idea of what's going on. Mm. I guess it does show the difficulty that they face where, as you say, you know, on Earth we can dig down 12 kilometres, mm. which, again, is still a big feat, but we can barely get 40 centimetres <laughs> into Mars. Mm-hmm. It just shows, I guess, you've, you know, obviously you've got no gravity and not a lot of gravity assisting you. and just I, the, I don't think it's the gravity so much. I think it's just the, the size the, of the equipment. Gravel. Yeah, the gravel. well, I, th- I think they just didn't expect such a hard rock. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, um, I, I'm just I kind of I'm really hoping this doesn't become the you know how the Russians never had any success mm. with Mars. I'm hoping this doesn't become the next thing. It's like we've now had 52 missions to Mars and none of them could drill into the, <laughs> what is what is going on there. They all fail for some reason. I just hope it doesn't go down that direction. I mean, Mars has been the hoodoo planet. Like we've had mm. like we've had pretty much almost total successful in Venus landing on Venus. I mean, they don't last long, but they get there. Mm. Um, 100% success on Titan. I'm just going to put that in there. Uh, and I think 100% Mars, of how many? Uh, of one. <laughs> <laughs> it's still it's 100%. Think, it, it's still 100%. And um, Mars, I think, is running at like 60%. And it's yeah. just because it's really tough to land there. And then, as you say, yeah, digging a hole is probably – it's another level of toughness. I mean, Penny and I, just before she was talking about her kids wanting to design a robot to, um, 
to do the washing at the moment I struggle to get a robot to move a sample 50 centimeters so <laughs> and NASA are getting the robot on Mars with the time delay to dig a hole hmm. that, that was pretty impressive hmm. but uh, unfortunately I, I just I cannot imagine the the, the frustration hmm. that the team must be feeling after I mean as you say getting it to land that's the first massive, mm. massive challenge, and the you know that whole the elation like, think of with curiosity, happens. yeah, like the, you know that whole the the minute of terror and all that sort of stuff of waiting for the are we going to get there? Are we going to get there? And we finally get it down. It's like yeah, successful landing. All <laughs> right, now the hard part's over. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that said, even if they don't get any further, they're still going to increase our information on the interior of Mars by an mm. order of magnitude. Just that one um, experiment, then that's apart from all the seismometers that, that InSight is putting all over the right. place. So just going down those few centimetres, it would have got through the lo- loose soil part. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, I, I made inverted commas there because, you know, uh, air quotes, soil, air quotes. <laughs> and, and, and then it's hit rock. That's, that's information. That's new. Mm. We never knew that before. Do we know it's rock though, or not? Like, because I read some stories indicating that it could have been a, a patch of sort of uh, um, gravel, a derelict alien spacecraft. Would... Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't read that, but that's, yeah. like, that's uh, <laughs> possible. I would imagine that they would have tested things like gravel. Um, that they would have. I I can imagine the test bed that they would have had for this machine, and I imagine that they had a big tank and they put lots of different layers in there. And they did say that if you had a hard bit of bedrock, that would maybe stop it quite early on. Right. And also you're talking very iron-rich bedrock Mm. because it's Mars and it's red. Um, And so that is, again, another layer of of toughness to try and Mm. get through. So, yeah. I I seem to recall seeing a photo of you standing in front of the Earth Twin of Curiosity um, am I remembering that correctly? You are, so, indeed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the ones uh, uh, that they use to kind of test on scenarios to go, how's how's it going to work over there? Yeah, at least yeah. on Earth, they can literally walk over it and go, all right, let's just reset that little bit. Yeah. Uh, can't do that on Mars. Yeah, well, I think, um, I don't know about the Insight team, but obviously Curiosity, because it can move around, um, JPL have this, It's it's a little garden it's well it's called the mars yard and they have basically the flight twin of of curiosity and what they do is they look at the photos that come down from curiosity and they put the rocks that they they make up the rocks like mars and then they can plan how they're going to drive it over things Mm. and especially that's become very important for curiosity because um its wheels are not brilliant Mm. (laughs) And the wheels are getting ripped up, and that's probably going to be the thing. You know, Oppy was stopped. Opportunity, sorry, was stopped by the dust storm. Otherwise, it would have gone forever. Um, Spirit got stuck in a dune. It's likely that Curiosity is going to be stopped because its wheels are going to fail. Yeah, it's already dragging one, isn't it? No, Spirit, I think, had the the one wheel that uh, got stuck yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, in the in the sand. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, th- I thought um, Curiosity had – I know they've got significant damage to one of the wheels, like it's all dented and stuff because they're not not like rubber. They're, uh, they're, yeah, aluminium. They're, they're they're like a metal. Yeah, yeah they're aluminium. And uh, it's because the rocks there were harder and sharper than they anticipated because we've never really been there before. You know, Well, mm. you know, Opportunity yeah. Spirit have, have gone so far, but where they are in Gale Crater, it has these sharper rocks and they've literally shre- shredded one of the wheels. And um, they're just being very cautious to not do that again. <laughs> Which I guess makes makes a little bit of sense when you consider, although that there's very light winds over there and there's this there's sort of dust moving around, they don't have grains of sand like we have on Earth and water eroding and making things rounded. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they're going to be they're going to be sharper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I wonder I wonder how many times the uh, JPL uh, 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 people and the NASA people have said, if only we'd decided to put wheels on this goddamn thing. <laughs> oh, on Insight? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and move it around a bit. I mean, that's, yeah. like, as soon as you put wheels, it makes it another order of complication. 
and and of the course, planning yeah. and and needing of a team to monitor it. And uh, Insight was always it's there to to put down some really good seismometers and to try and do, drill a little hole and to really measure the heat change. I mean, even if it doesn't get any further, it will sit there and there's a thermometer in there and it will be able to measure the heat dissipation. So if there's any changes, that's exciting. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like how we always used to wonder, why didn't they just put wipers on the solar panels for opportunity and <laughs> spirit? Yeah. Brush the dust. Even a little blower or something. Mm. Well, they, they kind of didn't <laughs> need to because Mars sort of cleaned them for them. Yeah, it did. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, they designed those missions the last 90 days. An opportunity yeah, yeah. lasted something like 14, 15 years. I mean, yeah. By the end of it, its drill was broken, its mass spec was broken. It was basically a camera on wheels. Right. But it was still going. Yeah. <laughs> it was a camera on wheels on Mars. <laughs> on Mars. <laughs> it kind of makes you, you, you think, is there a, even a chance of some dust devils or something coming through and cleaning its solar panels again and it might call home at some point or it's just we're not listening and we're not even um, I think that was the protracted long time yep. that they listened out for it. Um, I think, unfortunately, now it's beyond the capacity that they'll get that the – the, the batteries will be able to charge up again. Ah, uh, so, okay, right. Yeah, I mean, otherwise it might be like that XKCD comic. Do you <laughs> ever see that one? It's like, you know, 20, uh, yes. 20 It's like, all this bit is opportunities. <laughs> it's in charge <laughs> down there. We don't go there. <laughs> no, well, we have talked about 30-year-old satellites and spacecraft suddenly coming back to life and finding home or, you know, we develop a new technique that we haven't tried before 20 years later and we can restore contact with old spacecraft but uh, i guess if you can't if it's beyond the point of being able to charge the batteries there might not be anything that we'll ever see which is sad but it is sad but it did a lot it like absolutely I mean, the, the 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 coolest thing i think for it was discovering those hydrated minerals really early on the blueberries that's it did in its like first week oh yeah there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, that, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. That was the first sort of signs that was like, oh, water action, this is interesting. Exactly, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, without opportunity, you wouldn't, curiosity wouldn't have been able to, wouldn't have landed where it did and wouldn't be able to, you know, wouldn't have the right instruments to have done without that, that information from both spirit but also opportunity. Yeah. Okay, Penny, when it comes to twins, everyone knows that there's identical twins and fraternal twins. But it turns out that's not always the case. So do you want to tell us a bit about that and about the sesquizygotic twins born in Queensland? And you have to use that phrase as often as you can. I was thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't picked this story because I don't know if I can say that. But yeah, <laughs> sesquizygotic. So um, fraternal twins are twins where the they're essentially as um, unrelated as any brother and sister or, mm -hmm. you know, siblings. So two separate eggs fertilised by two separate sperm, um, two separate placentas, separate everything, even though they're sharing a uterus. And identical twins are when there's a single egg that's been fertilised and it splits in two. They share a placenta and they're essentially genetically you know, they get the same genetic inheritance. So this is really interesting because it's been suggested since 1984 that this could exist, this kind of halfway between a fraternal and identical twin. Um, and the way that this pair of twins were discovered was actually during the ultrasound. It was twins that were sharing a placenta, which means that they were identical twins, but one was a boy and one was a girl, which obviously cannot be if you're sharing mm. exactly the same DNA. So um, actually maybe that's not true. Maybe there's weird stuff that could go on with hormones in the womb. But anyway, definite like something strange is going on, alarm bells happening mm -hmm. here. Um, the first response was, oh, you've messed up the ultrasound, <laughs> um, which I think is pretty reasonable. Yeah. However, like given how rare this is, um, but what was found is that these twins actually were not identical, not fraternal, but as Ed says, sesquizygotic. So they're sort of 
in between monozygotic and diazygotic. They're kind of half and half, one and a half. So <laughs> this is the second known case ever. Oh, there had been one earlier. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, there was one um, in 2007, and these Australian twins are the second one. And this isn't just like, oh, the ones that have popped up. I mean, people have scanned DNA records of twins, which we have quite a bit of because twins are good to study um, because it helps us understand, you know, what things are genetic and what things are environmental or, you know, to what extent things are genetic and environmental. So... I feel like the process for how, a, how identical twins are formed and fraternal twins are formed, it makes sense. And this one is a lot more complex and very rare. And three separate things have to take place to get sesquizygotic twins, each of which are rare. First of all, um, an egg has to be fertilized by two sperm. This is really rare because usually once a sperm gets into the egg, the egg just doesn't accept anymore. Mm. And then what would usually happen if two sperm got into an egg is there'd be three sets of chromosomes. Now, humans, unlike many plants, can't hack that. So the, you know, the embryo just wouldn't develop. However, what happened in this case of the twins is a sperm with an X, a sperm with a Y, and the egg were there to combine. And they somehow sorted themselves out into three kinds of cells. Um, two of the cell types were typical. There was one chromosome from the mum, one chromosome from the dad, which was one XX, one XY. Um, but the third type just had chromosomes from dad and it couldn't develop normally. But the other ones, the ones which had one from mum and one from dad, were able to divide and grow. And then here's the third weird thing is not only did it get fertilized by two different sperm and then split into, you know, three kinds of cell types of which two were actually viable, it split to create two embryos. One looked like a, um, an ordinary girl, one looked like an ordinary boy, but they still shared a placenta like um, identical twins would. So, so that, so that, that splitting would have yeah. happened later on in the development than it normally would, I'm assuming, for... Yeah, uh, and it didn't happen perfectly. It's not like it all sorted out completely perfectly. So even though one of the twins was identifiable as male, one was identifiable as female, the actual genetic story is a bit different if you look at what's going on at a cellular level. So I'm just going to say the girl and the boy, but um, the the girl had an a mix of maybe 90% XX chromosomes, which is what we would say is typically develops as female, 10% XY. Mm -hmm. The boy was actually 47% XX, 53% XY. So a lot more kind of ambiguous yeah. genetically in terms of male or female. So the twins are now four. They seem to be developing pretty healthily on the whole. Uh, one has had... Um, surgery for an, an abnormality with um, the ovaries, mm -hmm. but that it was related to that sort of chimerism or that having a mix of different DNA. And, but, you know, they're just developing. And I guess um, it's not surprising that this is so rare and unusual. I guess these days seeing that in utero, um, that, that they shared a placenta and yet we're developing as male and female is a pretty pretty clear indication that something strange has happened. But it could be that in the past, maybe other fraternal twins have been mistakenly classified because, you know, if you didn't know that they had the same placenta, the, the subtleties could be easy to mix. Mm. So they looked at almost a 1,000 pairs of DNA and their parents, of twins and their parents, and found no more evidence of this. So it really does seem to genuinely be quite rare. And it's just, I think we've said before, like with science, you always, especially I think with biology, because that's what I know, you sort of learn, oh, this is how it works. Oh, but there's this exception. You know, sometimes you can get twins or whatever. Mm. And you're like, okay, but this is how twins work. And then there's something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, 
Yeah, it really, it's in, I do find it interesting how we always try and classify things and organize it. And that's very important for understanding. And yet, um, life always finds a way. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess complex. that's, that's any time yeah. you try and classify something, there's always going to be that outlier, whether we're trying to classify what planets are, then you're going to get a Pluto or something. And same with twins, you can go, okay, so you have these two types. Oh, hang on. There's another type now. And I think also, I think I read a, a statistic somewhere that like four out of five fertilizations probably fail to develop and they would mm. um, miscarry so early that the woman might not have even known she was pregnant. So I guess in a way, it's probably not the rarity is not so much that weird stuff happened, mm. but that it happened in a way that the, the babies could survive. Yeah, because I mean, when you think of the, the odds of just those two sperm fertilizing yeah, essentially oh. at the same time, yeah. you're talking, you know, one in a million or more with every um, attempt, I guess. So that in itself makes it extremely rare for it to then develop into those three cells and those mm. two of those to develop into uh, like viable embryos. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary and not surprising that it's only happened twice, I guess. Mm. But fantastic that they've survived and they're healthy and doing well that's terrific yeah, good luck to them yeah well speaking of um rarity medical rarities lucas listeners may have heard of timothy ray brown who was known as the berlin patient he was the first and until now the only person to be cured of hiv and I know cured is a dicey word when it comes to long-term and complicated illnesses like hiv but it is accurate in this case. He's shown no signs or symptoms since 2008. And now a second man appears to have been cured using the same bone marrow uh, transplant technique. Can you tell us a bit about these cases and how they were treated? Yeah, so as you say, the the original um, patient, the Berlin patient, Brown, was, was um, basically had received a bone marrow transplant, which luckily enough for for him as a sufferer of acute myeloid leukemia. Um, Lucky enough for him, the donor of that bone marrow happened to have a particular gene mutation which conferred upon the, the, the donor a um, basically it crippled something called the CCR5 receptor. Now, this receptor mutation, which apparently is only something it's only present in about one percent of the european population um this mutation is um oh sorry this the ccr protein is something that the hiv virus uses to to grab a hold of and get inside uh the cells so without the ccr5 protein hiv uh, hiv can't do what it does it can't uh, mm-hmm. you know it can't take over the cells so that for that reason um and the and the the, the berlin uh, patient um a scenario in whenever that was 2008 or something like that i think yep. it was yep. um since then it's it's been a subject of investigation by quite a number of of drug companies and researchers because it's clearly has a role to play in hiv now the thing that was interesting about this is this this new patient who had also a type of, I think it was a Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, in in this case, was uh, he was he was treated in a similar way. He'd had a, a, a bone marrow transplant, and his donor had been someone who had this same CCR5 um, mutation gene mutation, um, and that mutation then was basically bestowed upon him with his bone marrow, which then um, enabled his body to, I guess, attack uh, and repel the effects of HIV at the same time, because here's some nice, shiny new, you know, um, uh, um, immune cells that have come along for the ride. And also, um, you've got the ability to actually repel the, uh, the virus itself from the cells it's trying to infect. And what that means is you you basically you're hunting it down and you're stopping it from infecting you at the same time, mm. and and if you extend that out, it also brings along another beneficial scenario, which is that the virus then effectively 
um, infects itself to death because <laughs> what, what it does is it is it any remaining cells that don't have the benefit of that mutation are the only cells that HIV can can populate and and they die out and the other cells become the bigger population so it's it's basically sort of snowballs and that that's what appears to to happen here now the there was a lot of hype about this as there was in 2008, there was again a lot of hype about this, like, yeah, yeah, there's a cure, there's a cure. And there was very, very quickly um, some some media coverage on, on some really good blogs and, and uh, science websites as well saying, hang on, this isn't necessarily... The, you know this this in and of itself, although interesting, doesn't actually mean, okay, we've cured AIDS. And what it comes down to is we already have now some pretty effective drugs that, mm-hmm. that combat the symptoms of AIDS yep. and, the, and, and, and can, can stop HIV from developing to full-blown AIDS. And as a result of that, these drugs are quite highly available and they're used effectively around the world. Compare that with something like a very, very risky, invasive, expensive bone marrow transplant, which normally wouldn't be done for an AIDS patient. That was only because of the other illnesses that these two patients had that this was done. It makes it very unlikely to be utilized for this purpose. It was basically a byproduct, a very nice one, Hmm. a very nice byproduct, but it was a byproduct nonetheless. Um, What it does show, though, is that although this is not likely to become the go-to, you know, treatment for for, for, uh, HIV, it certainly bolsters the case for CCR5 being the thing to, to focus on. Um, and as I say, for over a decade, there's been, there's been drug companies and researchers that are doing exactly that, looking for ways to, um, to, to, to basically convey or turn off this gene so, that the, um, so it doesn't produce those proteins anymore, which then effectively can give the, pay, the, the, the person who's treated a, um, a resistance to AIDS. And this has been done in mice and, and rats and so forth already. Well, of course, that was the Chinese CRISPR babies. That was the CCR5 uh, gene that they had the modified version uh, implanted on them. And that's what Absolutely. the belief was that they would then grow to have uh, HIV immunity, which I think has not fully happened. There was that mosaicism, so it's partially there, but not fully effective. But uh, obviously, that's one approach that may end up taking off as a result of this sort of research. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I guess what caught my attention about this more than anything else was that, um, you know, there was, there was initially... Uh, a, a lot of very positive media about it because, hey, we've got a cure for AIDS, yay. Uh, and then it was a case of, no, 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 this has been done before. Yes, it's cool that it happened again. has been done before, but we won't be doing this for other people just because huge cost, huge risk. Um, there are better treatments here. We can pretty much give people normal lives now who have uh, contracted HIV. We can, we can manage their conditions. We can't cure them. We're not at that point yet, but we can certainly manage their conditions. And this is an extraordinary step which carries extraordinary risk um, to go to to cure them when, when there's not really a need to. But certainly, um, the, you know, the, the, the current um, uh, research and the, the, the line that they're following is, in fact, around this CCR5 uh, gene mutation and how they can leverage that because that appears to be the key to to stopping HIV. It's just a matter of how we do it. Very interesting. As as you say, I guess the scalability is the big issue here. And yeah, you want to be able to give tr- people treatment that they can have in a clinic, um, hmm. not having to go through uh, painful you know, bone, bone marrow, marrow transplant. transplant. Yeah, yeah, and not not to mention you can't just go down to the bone marrow <laughs> shop and and get <laughs> bone marrow with this this uh, mutation it's uh, you know it's not that available all right helen you've gone awfully quiet so i think we should talk about something that you find very interesting and is close to your heart oh i i've gone i've gone quiet because i always learn (laughs) being a guest on this um you know, I haven't done biology since I was 14. Right? <laughs> well, now it's time for us to learn something from you because uh, <laughs> your your passion and your uh, expertise is about Titan, the uh, moon around Saturn. That is, is it the only moon that we know of in our solar system, at least, that has an atmosphere? Uh, that has an atmosphere, probably. Or at least a depends. thick atmosphere that is... It's the only one with a really thick atmosphere because um, Sharon. Which, oh, of course. 
in whether it's a moon or a binary <laughs> dwarf planet also has an atmosphere yeah. and there's a couple of others with a bit of a tentative atmosphere like um europa if you're bombarding enough ice what you know and it's sputtering off is that an atmosphere or is it not a transient atmosphere? So again, but anyway, sorry yes again you start classifying things that always gets wonky <laughs> eventually but absolutely but um i've always wondered how it got this atmosphere and and where it came from was it something that was transported via comets or something like water to earth or something or did it come from volcanic activity or something what do we know about this thick atmosphere well it has to see you and me both ed and i think everybody it's um one of those perennial questions of planetary science is how did titan this small body that is about the size it's a bit bigger than the moon it's between moon and mercury in terms of size how did it get this atmosphere which is nitrogen dominated and much thicker than ours like our atmosphere at surface level is um one bar is one atmosphere as we mm. call it um around a bar it varies depending on whether you have a big storm going across or not um but on Titan, their atmosphere is uh, 1.5 atmospheres, roughly, which actually, because it's such a smaller planet, smaller, sorry, <laughs> a planet, smaller planetary body um, requires a lot more gas molecules to make something that uh -huh. thick, if that makes sense, because of the gravity um, scaling. So it's really, really, really thick. And um, there's been... I don't know. I think the, the, the jury is still out as to how it got this. Um, I, I guess the question is not really just how did it get it, but how, how has it not lost its atmosphere like Mars or something, yes. which has a lot more gravity well, to hold an atmosphere? Yeah. Um, it comes to a point, it's it's not so much how whether it's lost the nitrogen, it's the, it's the methane is more of the um, thing because um, the nitrogen is relatively stable. Okay. Um, and that's, that's always been the mystery. I think it was the mystery that was first put up by, uh, not Kepler, no, Kuiper. Kuiper, yes. He did. I always get those mixed up. I'm pretty sure it was Kuiper. And he first did the spectroscopic measurements of Tyson and went, oh, like they already knew it had an atmosphere, but they're like, why has it got methane? You know, that's that was the start of the mystery of this moon. Um so the reason that this has come up in the news is that there's actually recently been a paper which um, Ed actually um, alerted me to and I hadn't read, but I read this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, um, actually, they just, the paper, they just sort of work on a premise that was already investigated was that what if, so the theory is that the atmosphere might have come from comets um, that there wouldn't have um, been enough gas in the rocks that would have accreted to make Titan, so the little bits of rock that would come across to make this big nitrogen atmosphere. And so everyone works on this theory that short-range comets, uh, a bit like Halibop and um, 67P, and that was actually kind of where there's been a bit of a resurgence of this idea that comets had delivered the atmosphere to Titan is because we suddenly know a lot more about comets because of the Rosetta's missions, mm. um, a really amazing detail on, on 67P. So, But there is this alternative idea is what if the gas just came out of the rocks that accreted there? And we now have a lot more information about meteorites and asteroids um, than we ever had before as well. So these, this um, group, um, where are they based? Uh, they're based at Southwest Research Institute. Um, but they basically said, okay, there's these two theories. One, that it came from comets crashing into an already formed moon. Or two, it came because the atmosphere came from gas um, leaching or um, outgassing from the rocks that were there originally and they've basically tested the viability of these two models sort of is there enough nitrogen from what we know of meteorites that there could have been rock um, the gases coming out of the rock just from the core and the answer is yes um, versus 
the the idea of that it came from comets that they were sort of say okay if it came from one this is the if it came from the comets this is the isotope signature this is the they they do it a lot on the the nitrogen 15 and 90 nitrogen 14 ratios this is what we'd expect to see and if it came from this other thing this is what we expect to see um and they sort of just built up on an idea basically because we've got this big data set now from Rosetta. Um, I think the really impressive thing about what they've done is that they've taken a lot of disparate results from mm -hmm. missions. So everything from Giotto, which if you remember was the comet, the, the, the mission that went through Halley's comet tail okay. all those years ago yeah back in um, 1986 I think it was all the way through to Rosetta and they've sort of bunched together all of that chemistry information uh, and try to apply it to how we can understand the Titan atmosphere so it's it's, it's a pretty impressive bit of work I, I learned an awful lot from 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 reading it um, from my point of view um it's interesting because I'm interested in the end products that we know that there's all these these small we know there's nitrogen and methane in the atmosphere and we know that they break down well they don't break down they get um, radicalized this is a bizarre okay. term but radicalized by the <laughs> yeah radicalized by the solar radiation so that makes them uh, more reactive okay. and then they react together and they react together to form bigger molecules so from lovely things like hydrogen cyanide all the way through to benzene, which is also a very lovely molecule, <laughs> and acetonitrile. You're the only person I know who finds molecules to be lovely. <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. They're, they're, of course they are. And, and then the idea is because they're a bit heavier, they all rain down on the surface, and that actually the surface of Titan is actually made up of these sort of... Um, char this sort of weird molecules that are formed in the atmosphere then rain down and that everything we see on the surface all of the the geology and and um we you know we see river systems mm. we see cliffs we see we see lots of things that are very equivalent to what we see on earth but that's all happening with these small small organic molecules and so my current research direction is what are the material properties of these small organic molecules and uh yeah so that's keeping me out of trouble at the moment <laughs> didn't know anything could keep you out of trouble uh, oh yeah thanks then. <laughs> no but I, I agree with you i think the really interesting thing about this is that it's using those disparate sources of information that we have like when when we sent uh the rosetta to 67p chirimov Gerasimenko, we knew it would give us mm -hmm. clues about the origins of the solar system, the building blocks, all that sort of stuff, and, and comets themselves. I would never in my wildest dreams have thought, well, maybe we can use that to get an idea of how Titan's atmosphere formed. Although when you think about it in hindsight, it's kind of obvious. Can we use it to look at how water came to Earth, for example, and that theory that comets brought liquid water to Earth or icy water to Earth? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm nodding really emphatically. Um, <laughs> you can't; it doesn't work very well on the podcast. But that's absolutely the reason why we need as much information from as many bodies. I mean, I know I'm a bit down on Mars, <laughs> but every time we learn something about Mars, we learn something about ourselves. Um, and 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 that's why you, you know the Hayabusa mission. I I, I actually do think Hayabusa two is probably the most exciting mission that's going Agreed. on right Agreed. now, because because the asteroid belt is the museum of the solar system. It's full of um, cores that never made it to be a planet, and bits of planet that tried but then fell apart. And the more we can know about these sort of big rubble piles, the more we know about how the Earth started and and, and more about ourselves. So, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, as you say, it's not obvious why studying a comet will tell you about mm -hmm. Titan. But that's, an, as you say, that one of the really nice things about this this work is that it's, it's like everything in science. We're all building blocks. We... And planetary science is no no different. 
I will be very, very disappointed in our audience if I don't hear of a T-shirt in the next few weeks that says the asteroid belt is the solar system's museum uh, sometime. <laughs> that's, I would that's like beautiful. that T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I like that too. I was going to, yeah, that was, that was good. I like that. I have written that a couple of times. <laughs> well, own it. That's your quote. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be on the front though. That that would have the the asteroid belt quote on the front. On the back, yeah. would we'll just say wobble. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, 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 Lucas. Yeah, we can't have a show without with you on it, Helen, without the wobble coming up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's something that occurred to me just when you were talking there about the the makeup of the of the atmosphere of, of Titan. With, with regard to the nitrogen levels are about 97% and less than 3% of, of hydrogen. How do we know methane. Oh, sorry methane. Uh, methane sorry how do we know um, the how do we know which methane though because you're saying the different types of methane, the different you know um, weights I think you said 14 or and uh, uh, yeah no the isotopes, Actually, yeah, that was the one thing that really annoyed me about this paper, actually. That's kind of nice to bring it in. Um, so um, nitrogen can exist in both. Um, it's to do with the amount of neutrons in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. that you have these isotopes. They're essentially the same element, but they weigh a little bit more. And um, nitrogen has its nitrogen 15 and 14. Nitrogen 14 is the, the standard one. But you get times when you um, form the other one. You could tell I'm not a radioisotope chemist, but I have a lot of colleagues who are, who probably will listen to this and cringe at me saying this. But the thing that really annoyed me about this paper is they talked about methane isotopes. Um, and I was like, no, methane's not an element. It can't have an isotope. Right. And what they actually meant was the amount of heavy hydrogen, so deuterium, which is uh, hydrogen okay. but with two neutrons in the in in the methane molecule. And it, they could have that. That's what annoyed me because methane isotopes it, it's is a non thing. It, it really oh, it, it really got me because you also have the carbon in there as well. Right. And so carbon, oh, like carbon dating with, yeah, with its... carbon twelve and carbon thirteen. Yeah, exactly. So saying methane isotopes means that you can have you know different levels of deuteration on the different branches yeah. of the because methane's got uh, four hydrogens or deuterium stuck to it or you can have a different isotope in the actual you know middle carbon right. um and they only in the paper they talked about methane isotopes but they only talked about them in terms of hydrogen deuterium ratios um okay so that was a bit like Dudes, don't do that. That's not nice. I look forward so to reading we... your letter to the Astrophysical Journal where you uh, <laughs> bring I'm going to tell you something about molecules versus atoms. Um, uh... yeah. Just because it's International Year of the Periodic Table, I just feel like, no, we can't miss this. <laughs> Is, uh, so do we actually have measurements from Titan to know its ratios in terms of its nitrogen isotopes? Which ones are which? Like, do we know? Uh, yes. Yes, we do. Um, we have them both from Cassini. Okay. Um, had, and Boy, from so. Huygens, which is the 100% success rate landing. But you can actually also do it from Earth. So is it spectra um, that we get that from? Or? Yeah, yeah. You can uh, do it through the spectra. Um, I'm not sure about the nitrogen ratios but definitely the hydrogen deuterium ratios okay. you can measure through through um i think it's more like in the radio astronomy end of things right but okay. yeah you can measure those from a yeah cool okay because i think that's our show and as always all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web scienceontop.com slash 326 don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to become a patreon and for this week and next, we're giving all donations to Penelope Green's favourite charities, Doctors Without Borders and the Fred Hollows Foundation. Helen, thank you once again for joining us. Been great. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you as always, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you everyone for listening. And we'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then.
perception do you have of death metal? A new study at Australia's Macri University is probably dispelling some of the notions. Death metal fans are nice people, says Professor Bill Thompson, who has been leading the study. Thompson reveals that it's the conclusion of the study that extreme metal doesn't make listeners violent, but rather joyful. Bloodbath singer Nick Holmes, whose music was used in the study, says, the majority of death metal fans are intelligent, thoughtful people who just have a passion for the music. It's the equivalent of people who are obsessed with horror movies or even battle reenactments.